Thank you. He's back. <laughs> so what happened here was, evidently I'm the only person that's been asked to come back because the bishop told me that I needed more training. So he brought me back here. So see, see if I could do it right the second time. So welcome, everyone. For those people who have come that are outside of the church, which is a lot of you, the purpose of this evening I was asked some time ago, several times, by the bishop if I would come and share my story. And I said, I don't really have much of a story. And so I kept on declining. And then finally, he just gave me a date of October the 13th, and she, you need to be here. And so, of course, I obeyed him, and I was here. The purpose of the, the whole concept of this Truth College was to let young people know about things that happened in your life that may help them. And so that was the spirit of the program. And the spirit was, we want specifics. Where did you fail? Did you fail? Did you climb out of that? How did you climb out of it? What tragedies have beset you in your life? What did you do about them? And the whole concept was for these young people to learn from that. So that was the spirit in which I gave that talk, and that is similar to tonight. I, I feel bad sometimes talking about things that involve me, but there's enough things that you'll see that show a pattern on what I'm trying to express about my life. And so I have this clicker here, and although it's not a slideshow, it's gonna help me not to have notes. So I'm gonna start at the beginning if I can use this thing. And so I was a twin. I was born in 1948. I'm 74 years old. I had a number of brothers and sisters, five brothers and sisters, but I didn't know about one of them. And so that's part of my story. One of my brothers and sisters was a special needs child. He's in the center, and we're going to talk more about him later on. So I came from a a family where I had a very spiritual mother who was a prayer warrior, and my father was a tough, tough guy. My father, this is a newspaper article that he gave me that was the 45th anniversary of the Great Salem Fire. So this newspaper article was from 1959, and the Great Salem Fire was in June of 2014. And 20,000 people lost their homes in that fire. And my father was one of those people. He and his 12 brothers and sisters became disheveled. They lost everything. My father and his youngest brother became lost. They didn't know where he was. They thought he had burnt up in the fire. So can you imagine his grandparents looking all night and the next day to try to find their two, two of their children? And they finally found them. And the reason that this is part of my story is my father had an incredible work ethic. He ended up working for this. He had to quit school in the fourth grade. All his brothers and sisters had to quit school because they had nothing and they had to start building something back. And so they worked for the Salem Ice Company. There's the old horses they work for. As he grew older, he became quite the dapper guy, but he treated us kids sort of like he was treated. And he wanted us to have a work ethic like he had. So when we were 12 years old, he made us go to work. And I remember my first job, I was working in a Jewish delicatessen, and he had me down in the basement of the, of, the, of the delicatessen, the owner did, and I was cutting coupons out of day-old newspapers. Little did I know it was illegal, my father didn't care, but there I was, child labor, sitting down there cutting out these coupons for Maxwell House coffee, and it was five cents off Maxwell House coffee, and my job was being paid by the piece so I had to cut as many coupons, and I'd get two cents for every coupon that I would cut out, but the owner of the delicate test would get three. I graduated from that, and I started making honey-baked hams on the premises. Of course, Jewish people don't eat ham, okay, but nevertheless, that's what I was making. And then I got a job in a gas station when I was 13 years old, and it went on and on. And so the problem was 
I had to turn in half the money. And I'd say to my dad, why are you getting half the money? You want to eat, don't you? You want to sleep, don't you? And it was the same work ethic that he had. Every summer we were put into a field very much like this, my twin brother and I with the hot sun, and we would have to pick flowers, zinnias or straw flowers, and we'd be paid by the bunch. It was called piecework. I was starving to death because I wasn't very good at it. When I, be, when I was very young, my mother was instilling to me many spiritual principles. And when I went to school, they had a program where you would adopt children in Africa. Well, back in the 50s, we don't have the communication that we have now. And to do this, it was $50 to support a child or adopt a child. $50 in 1954 was equivalent to $550 today. So what we did is we, I would get together and be the big organizer and I would have a carnival in my backyard. And we would do that every year and every year we would be able to buy one of these, the, adopt one of these children. This was my mother. So the, most, the first tragic thing that happened to me was in the 1950s, two jets collided over Boston. And those jets landed very close to my home. And so my, myself and one of my friends was there and we were watching the fire. And whilst we were watching the fire, we stayed and stayed. And when they put the fire out, these two dogs ran into the fire and one dog ran out with the pilot's arm and hand in its mouth. And I had all this difficulty in overcoming that. I would have these terrible dreams, but my mother would pray for me, and she would pray for me incessantly. I can still to this day smell that jet fuel from that incident. So as my mother was instilling all these principles in me, I decided that maybe I would have a vocation. And my vocation ended up being that I entered the seminary. And as when I got into the seminary, you can see some of my acting skills here. When I got into the seminary, you know, it didn't take long for me to have a crush on the secretary of the seminary. And so I learned very quickly that maybe giving that up for the rest of my life was not in the cards. And so I left the seminary. And when I left the seminary, it was in the middle of the Vietnam War. And my twin brother had been drafted. And I was a divinity student, so they left me alone. And so when he was drafted, he did a lot of great things, but he ended up getting shot down. He ended up living to tell it. And I said, boy, I don't want to go that way. And so I enlisted. My job was in medical electronics. And my job was when they would drop a picker x-ray machine or a coulter counter or a flame photometer out of an airplane, my job was to go into the bush and set it up. I did that for six years. And during the same time, I was involved in this camp in New Hampshire, and it was called Camp Fatima. It was the first camp of its type in the United States. It was a camp that would take 150 severely handicapped children every year and take them from these state institutions. And it would take 500 volunteers to provide those kids with the joy and the love that they would have. It was a very expensive proposition. A number of my friends still do it to this day, 60 years later. And this camp, it changed my life in many ways because it gave me some meaning and purpose. And it made me realize, you know, that service to humanity was one of the best works of life. And so, as we got involved, in the camp, we would have themes, and every year there'd be something Alice in Wonderland, or there'd be some other crazy thing, and I was the volunteer fire department chief. This was my truck. And one day, there was actually a huge blaze, and I was, the adrenaline was just rising in me, and I ran, and I got the truck, and I got everybody to help me, and I'm rushing to the fire. And I said to the guys, hold those hoses, because when I engage this pump, you guys are going to fall down. It's going to be so strong. And they're waiting for us to engage the pump. I engage the pump and drip, drip, drip. I forgot to fill the tanker full of water. And of course, the, bla the place burned to the ground and I was fired. <laughs> I ended up 
at Shepard Air Force Base in a number of other places. And then I was stationed in Little Rock, Arkansas, and I thought God had forsaken me. <laughs> but I fell in love with Arkansas and its people and its climate. I actually lived in a 120-year-old log cabin that's still there today on Kellogg Road. This was my bachelor pad with my polar bear rug. I was all set to go. And then while there, I joined the JCs. And the reason I joined the JCs is because I wanted to meet girls. And so I joined the JCs, and I was getting all excited, and I was going to these meetings. And they were doing all these community projects in Little Rock and in Sherwood and North Little Rock. And they were helping the community, and I loved it. And they were teaching skills on how to speak and, you know, how to write and how to do all kinds of things like that. And I said, boy, this is really great. And then I, lo I looked around one day and I said, where are the women? They said, well, you fool, this is an all-men's organization. <laughs> so I missed the mark. And as I continued to do that community development stuff, I applied for a national job in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And there was a job that was open in a program called Operation Threshold. And I applied for that, and I ended up being the youngest th staff officer ever hired by the U.S. Junior Chamber of Commerce. And I got that job, and it was a job that was about alcohol abuse and alcoholism. It was funded by the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse. And we wrote programs, and I wrote a book called All in the Family. Back then, you know, that Archie Bunker thing was on, but. The whole program was about how we as parents are models for our children. Many times, if you're a Protestant, your kids are going to be Protestant. If you're Pentecostal, your kids may be Pentecostal. If you smoke, your kids may smoke. And if you're a drunk, your kids could be drunks. And so the whole idea was it was a program about models. Parents were models of values for their children. So I got involved in that, and things went pretty good, and then I was given another challenge, and that was to start 50 ministries in prisons across the United States. This is me, a little bit thinner, <laughs> at Stone Mountain Prison in Georgia. I also was involved and started the muscular dystrophy program with the United States Junior Chamber of Commerce. We ended up raising a lot of money. I was on the telethon a number of times and one of the times on the telethon, I was dating my sweet wife, and she, we were talking, and she said, gee, I sure would like for you to come home over Labor Day. I said, well, I'm going to be on the television. But, you know, I missed her so much, I left. And I came back to Oklahoma where she was. And we were going to have... a." Labor Day weekend, and we let, I let somebody else present the check to Jerry Lewis that year. But I probably should have stayed there because when I got there, she said, oh, honey, my sister just broke up with her boyfriend, and she, she's really sad, and she, can she come with us on the picnic? I knew that was going to mess everything up, but I really didn't know how badly. So we went on this trip, and when I was in the seminary, there was a donor that would donate riding lessons for the seminarians. So I knew a little bit about riding, and so did Melanie. And we were out there in Oklahoma like the Indians were, and we're just going back and forth, and we're, we're going all over the place. And finally, there was a great field, and I said, this would be a great place to have a picnic. Well, when Shireen came with us, she picked the largest horse in the barn. His name was El Sid. And when we were there and we were having a picnic, it was time to go. And she didn't do anything wrong. She didn't get on the wrong side of the horse. But the, the horse saw her peripherally, and the horse turned on her and kicked her, not once, but twice. And she ended up that far away, <gasps> and she was dying in front of us. Well, Melanie's father played center for Notre Dame. He was a huge guy. And before I left the house, he said, don't let anything happen to my girls, especially that one, which was Shireen. Well, now we're in the wilderness. 
I'm rushing. Okay, what are we going to do? We lifted up her shirt, and she had, we could see the hoof mark here and one over here. And she was dying, and so one of us has to go for help. So I, like the long ranger, got on my horse, and I was going and running for help. And of course, I understand I'm from Boston, and I got to a point where there was only one way that you could pass by. And standing right there in the passageway was a bull. And the bull was looking at me, you know, and, just, and I was scared to death. So I was throwing rocks at the bull and everything, and finally the bull moved. But I found out later it was a milk cow. How was I to know? He had horns. We got to help. Everybody came in. They had to walk three miles. I got her to the hospital. They rushed her into surgery. She, her liver was lacerated. Her spleen was ruined. Both lungs were gone. And I don't know what else, but she had five or six broken ribs. And she was in the hospital for several months. And when her father showed up, I didn't have two cents to rub together, and her father showed up. And I, no, at first I called him, and I said, hey, before I get anything out of my mouth, which one was it, Shireen? And I said, yes, sir. And he got there, and I said, I'm going to pay this bill. Well, it was an awful lot of money. So as this tragedy was going on, still at the JCs, I got to be involved with St. Jude's Hospital and Danny Thomas. And then U O'Brien, the U O'Brien Foundation. Most of these people, I met a lot of people, but there was only four or five of them who would actually ever remember me. And of course, they're all dead now, but Jerry Lewis was one of them, and U O'Brien was one, and Danny Thomas was another. And then we had, this was a presentation to Alan Page as a distinguished young American. Then there was this little story that involves my daughter, who's sitting out here tonight, both of them. And Nicole, Kendall, would you stand up, please, and say hi to everybody? Nicole. So there were, one of the 10 outstanding young men of America was a guy by the name of Wayne Newton. And when Wayne Newton received his, uh, the presentation, he invited us back to his home. And when we get back to his home, he took a picture with me and he wrote a little saying on the picture. Well, 30 some odd years later, or 35 years later, my daughter, who was in the fashion industry, was in California, and she happened to be working with Wayne Newton. And she said, Dad, do you still have that picture? And I said, yes. And so, would you send it to me? I said, why? He says, well, I'm doing a costume design with Wayne Newton right now. And so I sent it to her. She showed it to him. And he looked at the picture and said, Frenchie? And so he wrote a message on that picture. And then Nicole decided that she would take a picture with him and try to frame the same pose and sent that to me for my birthday, which I thought was sweet. So going through the JCs and doing all these projects, I started to get better, and I started to learn more, and I started to participate in more things. And then when the number one job came open, which was to be in charge of the headquarters and all of its employees, I applied for that position not thinking that I would get it, and I got it, and I was sworn in. And once that happened, I became involved in governmental affairs, because besides doing community development projects, they were really involved in doing things in the, uh, politically that made sense to the country. And so we had a public affairs program. I got to go to the White House a number of times. One of the times that I was at the White House, I was in the Oval Office with uh, uh, President Ford, and I whispered in his ear, would you be willing to come to one of our conventions? And he said yes. He ended up coming to the Cleveland Convention. And afterwards, when the thing was over, everybody loved him, and he whispered in my ear, can we go to the airport? And I thought it was kind of strange that the President of the United States would need me to drive him to the airport. But that's not what he wanted at all. I got to get into the limousine with the President of the United States and drive to the airport with sweat pouring off of me because I'm here, here we are talking about the price of peanuts in China, okay, and groceries and things like that. And it was like talking to my grandfather, and it was a wonderful experience. The same thing happened with this fella. 
And so as I met Ronald Reagan, we asked him to come to our national convention. He agreed. And then what happened? Someone tried to kill him. So when he was in the hospital, he stayed in the hospital. And when he got out, they weren't letting the president go anywhere. Nowhere. But he honored our request for him to come to our meeting. He conceded to do that. He agreed to do that. And it was the first time he went anywhere after someone tried to kill him. Well, in those days, security had changed after that event. When the president was on the freeway, the freeway shut down, not the exit. There were snipers on all the rooftops. It was unbelievable. We had 30,000 people in the auditorium, and they had it all empty, not once, but twice. And so then we got a call. The president is not going to enter through the front door. We're going to make him come in. This is after they had swept for bombs, and dogs were there, and everybody had to leave. They weren't taking any chances. And so he said, the president's going to enter from the back of the building through the garage. So myself and the executive committee went down to the area where the president would be, and we heard the door open. We heard the limousine come in. We heard the door come down. And I turned to the executive committee and I said, guys, the president of the United States is going to walk through that door in three minutes. Don't say anything stupid. Five minutes went by, 10 minutes went by, 15 minutes, 20, 25, 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Finally, the door opens. Ronald Reagan walks through the door. And classy me, instead of saying, welcome, Mr. President, thank you for being here, I said, where the Hades have you been? <laughs> and he looked down at his shirt, and he opened two buttons, and he showed me the vest. After all of that stuff, they still made him put on that vest. It was a great experience for me. That's the presidential seal, and here is Ronald Reagan with 30,000 people. Around that time, I was looking out my window and I saw this good-looking blonde lady walking across the parking lot. And I said to my assistant, who's that? Well, you hired her as an editor of the magazine. I said, we did? And I said, hmm. So I instantly started thinking about a policy that I wrote. And we had written a policy about this was way before sexual harassment was anything. But at the organization, we had a whole bunch of people there, and they were always having parties, and there was always trouble a brewing. So I just made a policy that you couldn't date anybody at work. So when I saw Melanie walking across the parking lot, I started to think about the policy. But, you know, I didn't do anything just then. Several months goes by, and as I'm tracking Melanie here and there, I find out that she's going to start a Bible study at lunchtime. And I decided that I needed some religion. <laughs> so I decided to join that Bible study. And after I went there for a while, I then decided I needed to change the policy. And so I wrote another policy, and then I asked Melanie out, and we started going out together. And so. This was that sweet lady that walked across that parking lot. Okay. Melanie, would you stand up? <laughs> this is my lifelong partner. <laughs> we just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary last week, and thank you, honey, for all the wonderful time together. As I was dating Melanie, some of my friends said, you've got to get rid of that banana wagon you're driving. You can't ask her to marry you with that banana wagon. This was my car. <laughs> and so I had to take a trip 
one of the last trips I was taking as the chief administrative officer of the organization. And I was going to Singapore. Well, a bunch of my buddies drove me to the airport. Little did I know what they were going to do when I was gone. When I got back, they took a settling torch and they cut the roof off of this car. They filled it full of dirt and put a tree in it. And when I drove back, that was the planter in front of my house. <laughs> so Melanie and I dated and we got married. That's just punch in that glass, no worries. And we raised some beautiful children. Yeah. So where were the failures? When I left the organization, I came to Arkansas and I ran a company called Four Seasons. And things were going along pretty well. And then one day, this fella drove up in this big Mercedes and got out of the car and I, re I said, Billy? And he remembered me, I remembered him when we were in the service. He actually worked jobs for me as a kid in the service. It looked like he was doing very well. He ended up buying a condominium next to mine at Lake Hamilton. And shortly after all this happened, I got a call from American Bankers, which is a large insurance group in Coral Gables, Florida. And they asked me to come down there for a job interview. And I did. And they offered me a position. Well, this was a long time ago. And so the position was paying $50,000 in an Oldsmobile. And so I came back and I was all excited and I wanted to talk to Melanie about it. And I said to Billy, this is what's going on and this is a great opportunity for me. He said, I don't want you to take that job. And I said, why? He said, I want you to work for me. I said, doing what? He says, running a stock brokerage firm or a bond firm. And I said, I don't know a stock from a bond. He said, no, but you know how to organize things. And I want you to do that. And I said, this company doesn't even exist. Well, he says, it exists in my mind. And I said, well, that's not good enough. He said, what do they offer you? And, he sa and I said, 50,000. And he said, I'll give you 100,000. And I said, well, they're going to give me an Oldsmobile. He said, I'll let you use a Mercedes. Now it sounded really interesting. I got with Melanie and I said, I got back to him and I said, I'll tell you what, under one condition will I do this, that for three years you don't take any money out of the company. He says, it's my company. I said, I understand that, but I don't know how much money you have and I'm not going to turn down this opportunity, okay, and if I'm going to be involved in something, I don't want you taking money out of it. Pay yourself a salary, whatever you want it to be, et cetera. And so he agreed. And this is back in the 80s. So after the first year, he made $1.2 million net. And he gave me this watch. And the next year, he made $800,000. And the next year, he made another $800,000. And then he sent me and my wife to Europe. When we get back from Europe, there was a bunch of corporations sitting on my desk. Continental Farms with Terry Bradshaw. Continental Leasing, Continental Oil, and five other corporations. And as I looked through them, my name was on every one of these corporations. And so was my signature. And I had agreed to none of it. And I said to Billy, what's going on here? And he said, well, this is some stuff that we started while, while you were gone. And I said, but my name's on it. Well, we want you to be the secretary treasurer. I said, I don't want to be on any of these things. I don't want to be on anything that my name is involved that I don't have control of because my name is all I got. A guy came into town shortly after that and he wanted to do a transaction. And the transaction would have meant $175,000 to the firm. But the transaction was wrong. It was bogus. It was a lie. And so Billy asked me to represent that package, and I said I wouldn't do it. And he said, you need to do it. I says, I'm not going to do it. Don't put me in that position. He put me in that position, and afterwards, 
the commission didn't go through, the deal didn't happen, and he called me every name in the book. I didn't mean to do this, but I walked into Lou's office and I says, I can't be treated like that. I'm done. And I tossed him my keys. I actually threw him my keys. And I hit him in the head with the keys. And he said, you can't do that. And I says, yes, I can. And I left. Now understand, the whole purpose of this exercise is to talk about failures and to talk about specifics. This was in the 80s, when a half a million dollars was a significant amount of money. And I was making a half a million dollars a year. And I walked away from it. But I had saved money. And then I went a year, two years, and then I said, I'm going to look for me a job. And then I couldn't find a job. I was either overqualified, underqualified, too old, but couldn't get a job. Well, then I said, well, I have some money, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a few businesses of my own. So I, ordered, I started an appraisal business. So this was my office with Billy. I, my next door neighbor was Mr. Dillard. This was my home on Edge Hill. There's good old Bradshaw and his quarter horses. None of that worked out. I said, well, I'm going to start me an appraisal business and work for the lawyers and a bunch of other people in town. And I did that. And then at the same time, I opened up a pretty high-class antique shop in the Heights. And we had all kinds of incredible furniture. We had bronzes and linky cabinets from France. And it was incredible. But nothing was selling. There were two families from this church, the Duckworths and the Hills, who helped me run it because I was doing other things. And, but I wasn't making any money. Was it a failed business? There's more to the story. So at the same time, someone talked me into opening a mortuary. A mortuary. One of the people that was working at the antique shop, her husband was in the mortuary business, and she told me that I needed to get into this business. You stab them, we slab them. And I said, well, wait a minute. I don't, I don't know anything about the mortuary business. Okay? And so, I can't believe it, but they talked me into it. And so, a mortuary is sort of like a wholesaler. So in Arkansas, like a rural place like Arkansas, if you have a serious ailment and you live in Monticello or Dumas or El Dorado or West Memphis, okay, or you live in Jonesboro or other places, you may have a hospital close by, but the best hospitals are generally in the capital city. So people would come to the capital city, and if they died, they would die in the capital city, and we'd go pick them up. And after we picked them up, we'd embalm them, put a smile on their face, and transport them at 90 cents a mile back to where they came from. <laughs> and that was sort of the mortuary business. We also had the only cremator in the city limits in those days. And so, one day, you remember, we went into business against somebody that had been in business for 60 years. 60 years. And the guy that ran their place came to work for us. 60 years. Three years later, we had 60% of their business. And then I got a phone call on the coldest day in January I can remember. And they said, Arthur, we have a fire. So I started to go to the mortuary, thinking we just had a fire. And as I went over the crest of the hill, there was a blaze in the sky. <clears throat> the place ended up burning to the ground. On the left is where the mortuary, there is the cremator. All of that was perished in this fire. Well, you know, if you have insurance, you can build back. 
when the fire marshal came, I wanted them to be thorough because I suspected that something had happened. And when the fire marshal came, their equipment was broken. No joke. I ended up hiring somebody from Kansas City, a fire expert, to come in to tell me what had happened, and it was arson. So then we had to put a fence around the place. We had to put a security system because if we were going to build back and it got burnt out again, no one's going to give you insurance. And so we did that. Everything was fine. Three years later, the darkest day of my life, on the front page of the Arkansas newspaper, it says, this morning we found the remains of blank, blank, blank from Jacksonville, Arkansas, at the Arkansas State Capitol storage room. Arthur Boudiette couldn't be located for comment. I was under the sheets. I didn't know what had happened. And what had happened was, three years earlier, when we burnt out, we sent our cremations to another place in Van Buren. And when they would do our cremations for us, you know, when I don't want to be morbid, but when you are cremated, what's left is bone. Well, the particular person that we were cremating three years earlier, which we didn't know, had so much bone that she filled up two boxes. And when they put the two boxes together, they tied them with string, and they sent them to me. But in the mail, the string broke. And because part of our name was state, they delivered one of the boxes to the state. Now, Judge Leverett's over here looking at me like, we need to bring this up again. But <clears throat> it was a terrible time. We ended up going through this, and we got sued, of course. We didn't know what happened, because the person who we cremated was reading the newspaper one morning and finds out that his mother has just been found at the Capitol. And she's thinking, who's in the cupboard? <laughs> she had saved the remains of her mother, who's still in the cupboard. God help me. And so, anyways, as we go through this whole process, we had all these forensic people involved. I wouldn't get out of bed. You know, it was an awful time. And as I was doing all this, we finally found out that it was the same person, okay? And so the insurance company said, we're not going to pay anything. I said, why? Because there were no damages. And I said, but there were damages. There were damages. We didn't know that it broke. That's fine. But that poor guy that read about his mother, there were damages, we're not going to pay because we're not going to, we're not going to, it's not, this judgment's not going to go against us. And insurance companies don't generally do that unless they're pretty sure. Well, we agreed to pay whatever it would cost to bring, to come to trial, to bring it to trial. It was the Friday firm that was doing the case. But it was something in my life that was kind of tragic. And it really was something that was upsetting to me. So here I had an appraisal business an antique business, and a mortuary, none of which did very well. And I had said bye-bye to a half a million dollars a year. So now I was kind of floundering. But, you know, sometimes God does other things in mysterious ways. Because when I had that antique shop, the one thing that was selling were these old books. And I had several shelves of books and they were selling like hotcakes. So it hit me one day, 85% of the books that were ever published in this country were published in one city, and that was the city of Boston. Why don't I sell books? That's where I'm from. I know some of you thought maybe I was from Dumas, but I am from Boston. <laughs> and so I started a business. And I started this rare book business, and it took off, and I have been blessed to still have the business today. Well, things were looking up for me. And then all of a sudden, there was a story on 60 Minutes that would set my life back. You know, I told you about my brother. 
Well, my brother had special needs, but when he was born, the doctor said to my mother that she would have to give him up. And she said, that will never, ever happen. He said, well, he has other things that are wrong with him. And he gets very rambunctious, and you're not going to be able to control him. And she said, I can control him. So Robert was a year older than my twin and I. Well, one day my brother was out. We were sitting there watching, and my older brother was pushing the lawnmower. And Robert got so excited, he ran up to the lawnmower, and he put his hand in it, and he lost all his fingers. And it was traumatic for us kids. Two months later, Robert's on the front porch, and he's waiting for my father, who he had a great love affair with, and he just was waiting for my father because he knew he had ice cream. And he was jumping up and down, and he saw his car pull up, and as he saw the car pull up, he went like this. And one of his arms went through a plate glass window and cut an artery, and he almost died in front of us. So my father knew some politicians, even though he only had a fourth grade education, he was a very likable fella. And so he, he, he found out some people in the city that may be able to help him find a home for Robert. And there was a supposedly world-renowned school called the Walter Fernald School. And it had thousands of kids, but most of them had been dropped off and abandoned by their parents. Well, my father never abandoned Robert. Every single Sunday, he would go and pick him up and bring him to the house. One time, Robert grabbed the steering wheel and almost killed them both. So people would go and they would restrain Robert, but he would come home and he would love being in our home. We never had a full vacation because we always had to go get Robert. And my father was laid off from the Ford Motor Company after 30 years. And it moved to Ohio from Somerville. And when all that happened, he got to a job as a maintenance man in our town. And he was out at Kroger one day, and this gentleman walked up and he said, Frenchie? That was Frenchie Senior. And they said, Frenchie? And he looked at him. He said, John Clifford. Well, John Clifford was a big shot with Ford, and he remembered my dad because he was a likable guy. And he said, how's Robert doing? And my father would talk about Robert. And he said, look, I got a job with S.S. Pierce. S.S. Pierce is a big company in the New England area, okay? And they have all kinds of confections and a lot of candies and things like that. And he says, you know, Two, two or three weeks after Easter and two or three weeks after um, Christmas and things like that, we have all this candy that we have to pick back up. What would you think about it if we sent a truck to your house with all that candy? And my father said, that'd be fantastic. And so he was going there every Sunday, and as he went every Sunday, he'd have wheelbarrows full of candy. And some of these buildings had bars on them, and kids would be looking out the windows and saying, it's the candy man. The candy man's here. And he would give those kids all this candy, and they loved him. And my mother loved that he was at a safe place, or at least we thought it was a safe place. And then on 60 Minutes, this happened. CBS News, America's deepest, darkest secret. Secret medical experiments on children radioactive injections in Quaker Oats. You can look it up today. It was after the Korean War. They took these kids, and my brother was one of them, several hundred kids, and they injected them with radioactive material and laced their cereal. Robert got worse. We didn't know why he was getting worse. Everybody sued. The place went to disarray. They disbanded the place. It ended up being haunted. They were trying to use it for other activities, and people would protest and say, people died here. Everybody sued, all but one, my mother. I said, Mom, you need to sue them. Why? 
They're bad people. I'm going to pray for them. What am I going to do with that dirty money? I said, I can sanctify that money, Mom. <laughs> she would have no part of it. She just wanted to pray for them, even though they had done those terrible things to her son. I then got involved in politics. My father disowned me for a while. This was Senator Brooke. He was the first Republican African American in the United States Senate. And he was a great guy. And he was from Massachusetts. And I supported him. My father didn't speak to me for months because he wasn't a Democrat. <laughs> and I, because he was in the union and he was in all of those kinds of things. And then I met a guy named Sheffield Nelson who became a great friend, and I ran his campaign against Tommy Robinson, which was a bloodbath. Tommy Robinson was injected because he changed parties to bloody Sheffield before he took on Bill Clinton. And Sheffield's negative rating went to 39% because of the Acoma Basin and because of Jerry Jones and all of those things. Not that they did anything wrong, but they made it sound that way. Uh, and then one day I got a call and it was from some guy named Huckabee. And he says, will you meet with me? And I said, sure, I'll meet with you. We met at Shoney's. He gave me his big spiel, and I said to him, let me see if I understand this. You're a Baptist preacher. You live in Hope, Arkansas. You have zero money, and you want to run against the most entrenched senator in the United States Senate, and that is Dale Bumpers. He says, that's good. I said, well, I'll pray for you. <laughs> I ended up helping him in that campaign, and later on, you know, he became lieutenant governor, and then he became governor, and at that time, he asked me if I would go to Social Security, and I would go work at the Social Security Administration because there was a lot of trouble, and the guy that had been appointed there went and put everybody on probation the first minute he was there. And then he was in front of the, the, the Arkansas legislature, and they were asking him questions about the program, and he would get frustrated, and he would say, Senator, it's the same thing in the other 58 states. And the senator would look at another senator, and they'd say, did he say 58 states? And so I told him I would do it for one year, one year. Well, I won't tell you how long I've been there. You know, and then I got it. And then Mike Beebe became very close because Mike Beebe was very good to my employees. Mike Beebe was the guy that increased the, the salaries for all my employees and, and took us away from the dreaded salaries we were getting. He gave us subpoena power that we could subpoena people anywhere in the state for their, for their financial records if they were committing fraud. And he did so many other things. And during this whole time, my sweet wife was trying to search for things that involved her family. You know, all this genealogy stuff that's come out, and they have all these ways to find things. And so as she was doing that, there was a person that used to work at the, at the Social Security Administration who was really good at that kind of stuff, and I'd ask if she would look into it. And so she did. And as she was looking into it, I wanted to know specifically if she could trace Melanie's mother, because Melanie's mother and Kendall and Nicole's grandmother was an orphan. But Melanie's father was also an orphan. So they started researching things in that regard and something that was incredible, and I've told some of you this before, if you can just think about this, if you can comprehend this, Melanie's grandmother, who died at our home just a few years ago, Melanie's, Melanie's mother, her father, which would be Melanie's grandfather, was on this planet when Abraham Lincoln was president. How can that be? Because good old grandfather was 83 years old when he fathered Melanie's mother. And Melanie's mother was in her 80s when she died. So she's finding these kinds of things out. I said, I'm going to look at my side. But let me look at the Irish side because my father said, you're French. Don't ever tell anybody you're Irish. I said, why? He says, because you're French. I said, okay, Dad. So I started looking at the Irish side of my family. And as we were looking at the Irish side of my family, I decided to call one of my cousins. 
And that cousin, one of 36 on the Irish side, I said, Ann, how are you? I haven't talked to you in years. Tell me about your dad. When did he die? What do you mean, die? He's sitting right next to me. I said, how old is he? 96. You want to talk to him? I said, he talks? <laughs> he gets on the phone. He starts telling me stories about my father. Your father was a funny guy, and your father could never tell you and your brother apart. I said, what do you mean? He says, he used to line you up. He used to put a St. Christopher medal on you, and when somebody would come up and say, which one's Arthur and which one's Alan, he'd say, well, the guy, the one with the St. Christopher medal, that's Arthur. He's a Catholic. And that other guy there, he's a Protestant. <laughs> so my 96-year-old uncle, who I thought was dead, is telling me this story. Well, right in the midst of all this genealogy business, I got a call from one of my cousins. And he starts saying, there's a family secret. And I said, well, what's the family secret? He said, I don't think I'm a Darrington. I said, look, just look at that nose of yours, and I can tell you you're a Darrington. And he says, my mother said that there's a secret. She, I said, well, what's the secret? That my dad, which would be my mother's brother, was not a Darrington. I said, well, let me have my genealogist look into that. So she looked into it. She called me back a day later. She said, maybe something to that story. And I said, what do you mean? Your mother's 11 brothers and sisters were all born in the same city, except for one, the one you're talking about. He was born 12 hours away in Nakawaka, New York. And in Nakawaka, New York, in those days, in the 30s and the 20s, there was a Catholic institution there for women who had been raped or women who didn't want to abort their children and it's closed down, but guess what? The state of New York bought it in 1950, and they still use it for child welfare, and I'm told that many of the records are still there. I said, Brian, why don't you call there and see if you can find something out about your dad, about my uncle? He does. But before he does, he goes and he talks to Uncle Roger, the guy that's 96 and still alive, he ought to know something. This was his brother. Surely he would know if he was truly his brother or not. He went and talked to Roger. Roger got very aggravated, very aggravated. He wouldn't answer the question. And so, I should be right here. So, he called the place. He got a hold of the lady that kept care of the records and asked if Charles Darrington had been born there in 1931, I don't know what the date was, let me look. And the answer was yes. Yes, he was born here. We have an address at 12 Whittemore Street. Well, 12 Whittemore Street was our parents' home, my grandparents' home. So we knew it was right. And then he asked the question that he knew the person would not answer. And the question was, who was the biological mother? Who gave birth? to Charlie, and the answer was Mary Helen Darrington. The phone rings, it's my cousin, and he says, Uncle Arthur, I have some news. I says, well, I'm, I'm not your uncle, I'm your cousin. He said, no, you're my uncle, and my father was your brother and your mother is the person who gave birth to my father. So all this is spinning around and all this genealogy stuff, and I'm just, just so confused about that. My mother's never said anything about it. Roger, her brother, has been denying it. What's going on? And around the same time, she does some more stuff, and she says, I did some more poking around about the Darringtons. And you have an uncle... Roger Darrington, the guy that's still alive, that's a war hero. I said, well, we had a bunch of them that were in the Battle of the Bulge and places like that. No, this is a real war hero. I said, well, how's that? Well, the guy was given the Distinguished Flying Cross among 
many other medals. But he was given the Distinguished Flying Cross by none other than, Senate, than Admiral John McCain. Now that would have been John McCain, the Senator's grandfather. At the time, I was doing a project on Social Security with Tom Cotton, and I happened to have his cell phone number. And I didn't want to abuse it, but it was getting close to Memorial Day, or Veterans Day, I don't know which, and Uncle Roger's health was going down fast. As a matter of fact, I got a call that said, Uncle Roger, we have to put him in the Bedford old soldier's home. I said, why? His heart is really bad, and he's not going to last very long. So I called Senator Cotton's cell phone. He didn't answer, of course. I left him a message. I said, Senator Cotton, it would be really something if I don't know John McCain, but it would be something if you could reach out to Senator McCain. Senator McCain was in bad health himself. This was like five years ago. And tell him the story about my uncle that's still alive, who's near death, because it was his grandfather who presented him the Distinguished Flying Cross. It would be nice if he just said something or acknowledged in some way Roger before he passed away. I didn't hear nothing. A day later, I get a call from Senator Cotton. We've already looked into this, Arthur. It's an amazing story. He said he took on six Japanese fighters over the aircraft carrier. They, all, his, all of the Americans were lost. They took out all the Japanese fighters except for one. And your uncle stayed and took out the last one knowing he was running out of gas saved the carrier and crashed into the Atlantic and lived to tell about it. I said, wow. So Senator McCain got on his back and forth. He was in Hawaii at the time, and so he was sending communication back and forth to his staff. This is Uncle Roger. This is the citation from the Secretary of the Navy. This is Admiral McCain congratulating him on the Distinguished Flying Cross. And this was the letter that John McCain sent. Roger, having recently learned of your efforts in World War II, I wanted to reach out to you as a fellow brother in arms to thank you for your service to our country so long ago. The honors and medals that you earned were a small token of our country's appreciation. I am honored to reach out to you, and I know my grandfather was equally as honored when he presented you with the Distinguished Flying Cross from your heroism in 1944. To complete 56 missions in a hell diver bomber is beyond most people's comprehension. You are the true embodiment of America's spirit in an American hero. Blah, blah, blah. John McCain. Well, John McCain had members of the different branches of the service bring that letter to Roger. With tears in his eyes, he was presented the letter, and 10 days later, he died. So this is my lovely mother. So the moral of the story here is, in the matter of a couple of months, I learned that I had a brother that I didn't know that I had, and I had an uncle that was a war hero that was still alive and was able to bless his life before he died. These are his kids who ended up living in the projects. And we always wondered why it was that our family never had much of a Christmas, because my mother knew these were her grandkids, but for some reason nobody knew it. And we couldn't figure out why did all the brothers and sisters protect my mother. And we learned it was an Irish blood oath that they were always going to protect my mother. I don't know the circumstances of what happened when she was so young, but I know that my mother did not abort that child. And I know because of that, these people live today. Brian is the one in the middle, and he was the one that was calling me and now calling me uncle. This is my brother Charlie, the little guy on the far left, and this is him grown up. So after all this, 
What I want to tell you about now is something really special. I want to tell you and I want to introduce you to the greatest missionary that I ever knew. And that missionary was Sam Stephen Patterson. He was born on November 17th, 1994. And it wasn't long thereafter that he got a devastating disease called metachromatic leukodystrophy. Sam went to the Baptist school and he learned about Christ and he learned about people who didn't know him. And he carried a burden in his life. And the burden that he carried in his short life was how come all these kids in China don't know my Jesus. And he had that all through his life. And as he had it, he obsessed about it. And as he struggled with this disease that took away his ability to run and his ability to walk and his ability even to use his legs at all and to be into a wheelchair and continue to disintegrate, he never complained. He never complained. And he never complained because his parents instilled in him this faith in God. And I want you to meet his mother, Bobby Patterson. Please stand up, Bobby. <clears throat> so you see, service to humanity is the best work of life. And making your life stand for something is important. Sam made his life stand for something. There was this huge drive that took place. And this huge drive was to create Bibles that would be written in Chinese. And those Bibles would be done for the love of Sam. And we would be brought into China at the risk of those people who were bringing the Bible's lives. And thousands and thousands of these Bibles, because of Sam, were brought into China. Sam, he, Sam had a wish that those people would know his Jesus. And he also had a wish that he would live beyond Jesus' birthday. This is Sam and I on Christmas Eve, Sam died 36 hours later on December the 26th, 2003. From the day he died to this day, nearly 20 years, this picture sits on my desk. I see it every day when I walk into my office because it reminds me that service to humanity is the best work of life. And it reminds me Okay, that your life needs to stand for something. It needs to matter. After that happened, we were involved in this community group, and this community group supported Sam in every way that they could. They were there for him all of the time. And a lot of those members of the community group are here tonight. And one person in our group had a dream. And that dream was to start a ministry. And they wanted to have a ministry that took care of inner city kids. And so that dream was made true by Sonia Mendelssohn. Sonia, are you here? There's Sonia. Say hello to Sonia. And Sonia had this dream that she wanted to do things because her heart was as big as the ocean. And she wanted to do things that would bless people in a huge way, in a monumental way, because that's the way she thinks. And so we got together, a community group. And one of the things that we did was we paid off a building, okay, of the Crisis Pregnancy Center here in North Little Rock. Kathy, would you stand up? I see you back there. Kathy was one of the beginner, the founders of that program. And it provided a place for people to go 
where they didn't have to abort their children. It gave them an alternative. And that program grew and grew. And other members of our group, that went on. And with, with the Mendelssohn's dream, the Fishers, and the Pattersons, and the Boudiettes, we started this program. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it blessed people. Here's Chris Fisher with Keith Jackson. We, end up, we ended up having a car wash is how we started. We made $500 the first year, and then it was 6,000 the next year, and then 20, and then 200, and then 400, and then 600. And then we started bringing people in like Amy Grant, and we had this huge banquet, and we did it for 13 years. And here's Dr. Mendelssohn, who's also back in the back of the room, who presented $1,020,000 in this one year for this program in Central Arkansas. These are the people that made that happen. And it was a blessing, because service to humanity is the best work of life. And then I stood down for a while. You know, after you do stuff for a while, you just want to get away from it. Not only do you want to get away from it, but the people that you were bumming money from, they don't want to see you coming anymore because they run the other way. And so we stood down for a while, and then a good friend of mine, Robert Chandler, who's here tonight, Robert Chandler invited me on a trip. And on that trip, we went to Puerto Vallarta. You should have seen me on that little airplane. It was a sight to behold. And we got to Puerto Vallarta, and somebody else was on that trip, somebody that became one of my best friends, and that was Judge Mark Leverett. Judge Leverett is here tonight, and Judge Leverett kept on challenging me as he told me his story and what he had gone through in his life. It inspired me, and then he wanted me to get involved in a program in Arkansas called Tendanji. And Tendanji is a Swahili word, making things happen. And this church even supported this effort. So they have several programs. They have a program called Program Impact, which helps kids with reading and math deficiencies. They have a program called Reclaiming Scholars, where it helps kids who have difficulty in school and are being suspended or are on the verge of being expelled. And they take them in to try to make productive citizens out of them. And then there's a program that they have an art program, and it's by Timmons Art. And it's one of the best programs in the state. Timmons, are you here? There she is. And so this program helps kids, this program helps kids reach their God-given talents. And you'll see this bus running around Pulaski County, which was a bus that we now pick these kids up and bring them to the school. So where's the end of this? Yes, I still am at Social Security. I'm the most tenured director in the nation, and I don't know what that means other than the fact that I've been blessed to have two jobs that I really love, the book business and Social Security disability. And the reason I love it is because I believe that it's service to humanity. And I believe, did we lose the? And I believe that that's important. So. You know, we've talked about a lot of things tonight, or at least I have. <laughs> but I want you to know that all the things that I've done in my life, the tragedies that I've seen, the downs that I've had in business, the ups that I've had, none of it matters. Because if I don't have these people and take care of these people and make sure that these people know Jesus Christ, my life is worthless. I have failed in every respect. So, you know, sometimes you go and you go to hear a sermon. And sometimes that sermon says different things and it speaks different things to people. Well, 35 or 39 years ago, a friend of mine dragged me to a, a, a preacher's meeting in Alexandria, Louisiana. It was full of Pentecostal preachers. I didn't know what I was doing there. Okay, but God had a purpose because this sermon that this Bishop Wagner gave at that time moved me. I'm not going to let you listen to the hour's worth of sermon, but I want you to listen to a minute and a half of it because the sermon was about Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'm thinking, well, if it's about Sodom and Gomorrah, it's going to tell me 
more about obeying God. But that's not what I got out of it. That's not what I got out of it at all. I want Ladies you to hear and it. gentlemen, uh, he brought him out of the city uh, and told him, uh, don't look back. Uh, but about this time, uh, about this time, uh, as they began to make their exodus uh, out of the city, uh, and Lot's wife hears the crying behind her. Uh, she hears the screams in Sodom. Uh, no doubt Lot's wife might have thought uh, of her mother, uh, or she might have thought of her best friend uh, that's now burning up in the city. Uh, she heard the cries uh, going up a baby. She heard the cries uh, going up um, of her best social friends that went to the social clubs with her. Uh, she heard the cries uh, of all that were around her and being a woman. Uh, she became so sensitive. Uh, she began to cry. Uh, in my mind, I see one of Lot's daughters uh, beginning to think about their husband that they left behind. Uh, and I can see them running out and saying, maybe I shouldn't have left them. Maybe I shouldn't have gotten saved. Maybe I shouldn't have come over here. Maybe I shouldn't speak in tongues. And while she's worried about her husband, I can hear in my mind the daughter screaming. And about that time, Lot's wife being worried about her daughter, not her fur coat she left back there. But her daughter, her baby is crying. Her baby is hollering. Her baby is begging. Have mercy. And she turns around to look. Maybe at the daughter. Maybe at the problem. And the moment she does, she's turned to a pillar of salt. I can see in my mind the daughter saying, Daddy, Daddy, something's happened to Mommy. Daddy, Daddy, uh, Mommy is turning into a pillar of salt in front of her eyes. Uh, I can see a lot of tears, uh, big drops of tears uh, running down his hot cheeks. Uh, they said, Daddy, don't you care? Daddy, aren't you sensitive? Daddy, don't you feel? Uh, but Daddy said, God said, don't look back. Uh, I can't afford to turn around. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, he brought him out of the city uh, and told him, uh, don't look back. Uh, but about this time, uh, his uh, about this So what's the moral of my story? Well, I've had a great life and I've been blessed. God's blessed me with incredible friends and family. But about all of this, I think the moral and the truth of this is it doesn't matter what big shots you may know in Hollywood. It doesn't matter if you don't have things of great value. It doesn't matter what presidents you may have spoken to in the Oval Office or introduced, or what amazing books you might own, because they're just gonna burn up. But what does matter? Our relationship with Christ, our relationship with our families, but it also matters that service to humanity is in your lives. It also matters that you have meaning and purpose to your life, the kind of meaning and purpose that Sam had. Have you blessed someone? Have you witnessed to someone? Have you sacrificed for someone? Have you suffered? For someone, if you hadn't, don't look back. Don't look back on what you haven't done and don't look back on what sins you may have committed. Don't look back on who you wronged. A place called Golgotha took care of that. Someone's blood took care of that. So don't you dare look back. Just look forward and what changes you're gonna make. Just look forward to what service to humanity you are going to get involved in. Just look forward on what meaning and purpose you are going to give to your life. Socrates said, to know thyself. And Cicero said, to be thyself. And Jesus Christ said, to give thyself. I said, God said, don't you dare look back. 
I don't know about you guys, but I'm just looking forward. We've been challenged, haven't we? We've been abundantly blessed. Thank God for this evening. And it's so wonderful to sit and think and think about what have we done and what are we going to do in the future. What do you say? Let's make it the best ever. Thank you for coming. Thank you for such a wonderful evening. Thank you for sharing this time with us. God bless you and all of you that have come here tonight. Well, just got to invite you back to church. We got church tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. Amen. You'll love it. God bless you. Thank you again for coming. Thank you.